Mm -hmm. Okay, handing uh, off to Chuck uh, Allen. Okay, I hope I'm not ghost-like. Um, Jeff, we're uh, in the process of moving to hybrid meetings at this point, so there are a few glitches we're still trying to work out, and I'm sorry about your bad news right. and the miscommunication about the date. No, it wasn't a bad week. It was just a long week. <laughs> yeah, I've had one, too. I've been up the last couple nights imaging planets, so it's, you know, ah. and the problem is I still have a nine-to-five job, so, <laughs> like... Wait till you get rid of that. It'll be... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That will be sooner rather than later, yeah. so... Um, our guest tonight is Jeff Chester, who is the public relations officer and has been the public relations officer at the United States Naval Observatory for a mere 25 years. Um, for 19 of those years, he's held various positions also at the Albert Einstein Planetarium at the Air and Space Museum. I assume that's the one downtown. Is right. that correct? Yes. Yep. And, and that was 19 years before going up to the observatory. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, uh, previous to the 25. Right. We've been at this for quite a while. I apologize. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Jeff is a, a very avid amateur astronomer, as you've probably sensed already. He's a member of our largest lead society, uh, the Northern uh, Virginia Astronomical Society, or NOVAC. He's also a member of ALPO uh, and a member of the IDA. And he's going to be speaking tonight about the history and mission of the U.S. Naval Observatory and also about some of his experiences with, I think, four different uh, vice presidents who, of course, live on the U.S. Naval Observatory uh, property. And so uh, without any, uh, well, I should mention also that I think he has a relative, a great uh, grandfather who served as superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory from 1902 to 1906, uh, Rear Admiral Colby Chester. So Jeff, thank you so much for being with us tonight. <coughs> you, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Thank you all for attending. Um, yes, my, uh, by a curious quirk of history, my great grandfather was indeed the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory from 1902 to 1906. Uh, it had really had nothing to do with my getting the job there. Um, for the record, he passed away 20 years before I was a thought. Uh, so I think we're pretty clear on that one. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to uh, set up my, do my share screen thing here, and hopefully this all will work out properly. And uh, we'll commence with uh, my program. Looks good. All right. So let's see here. Okay. We got to hit that. And then we got to hit that. There we go. Um, so, as I say, I have uh, been working at the Naval Observatory for a little over 25 years now. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about being at the Naval Observatory is the fact that it is, in many ways, the oldest continuously operating observatory that we have in the United States. Um, one of the things that was uh, th that led to our founding uh, was uh, a uh, was was a speech that uh, President John Quincy Adams gave before Congress um, in 1825 on December 6th, where he bemoaned the fact that there were no astronomical observatories in the United States. Whereas in Europe, there were hundreds of what he called lighthouses of the sky. And that he thought that this should be one of the highest priorities for his administration was to uh, establish a national observatory. Uh, that didn't actually happen under his particular, uh, at, at his particular time. Um, but uh, we'll go into the history of exactly uh, when we came into being and how. But first of all, just a little bit about me. Um, I have been doing this, as, uh, as, as Chuck mentioned, for a long time. Uh, so on the left is a uh, much younger, skinnier Jeff with uh, a three-inch uh, three 
uh, Mertz Uchnieder und Fraunhofer refractor that I managed to find. Uh, and my old astronomy club up in Massachusetts, the Aldrich Astronomical Society, helped me restore it, and I exhibited it up at Stellafane in 1976. So that's the picture on the left. Um, but over the course of the years, my telescopes uh, have gotten a little bigger. Uh, so the one on the right is uh, the 12-inch Alvin Clark uh, George Segmuller refractor that was commissioned uh, at the Naval Observatory in 1895. And as I like to tell people, that's actually one of the newer instruments that we have on the grounds these days. So let's start with the beginnings of the Naval Observatory. Uh, there are three key figures uh, who uh, span our first decade, uh, and that would be the gentleman on the extreme left, Lieutenant Lewis Goldsboro. Uh, in the middle is Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, and on the right is Lieutenant James M. Gillis. Lewis Goldsboro was a naval officer who actually had served for a long time. Uh, he actually joined the Navy uh, or was joined to the Navy uh, at the age of seven, uh, back in the day when you could do that sort of thing. Nowadays, you know, they, they probably would uh, call it child abuse or something like that. Uh, but he was uh, attached to the Navy uh, at the age of seven, and at the age of 14, he underwent his first sea voyage. Um, later on, uh, in the later 1820s, he was on a voyage to deliver a new ship uh, that was destined to go to the Asiatic Squadron. Uh, and in those days, there was no Panama Canal. So you basically had to go the long way to get to the Far East. And the long way at that particular time was to sail east uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, provision in the Azores, then sail down the west coast of Africa, and eventually find your way over to the Indian Ocean and your destination. Um, so they were about, uh, they were about uh, three months out of New York, uh, and when they got to the west coast of Africa, where they expected to make landfall, uh, they actually found themselves in the Cape Verde Islands, about 100 nautical miles away from where they thought they were. Uh, Goldsboro knew enough about navigation that he decided that he better figure out why this enormous error had taken place. And what he found was that the chronometer on board the ship had not been properly rated, uh, and they had no idea what its true running rate was. Uh, the rating card that came with that chronometer indicated that it gained about three seconds a week, in, or excuse me, three seconds a day. In reality, it was gaining 12 seconds a day. Uh, and so the cumulative error over those first few months at sea uh, compounded to essentially produce the error in the position that they observed. So when he got back to Washington, he decided that the Navy needed a little place, a depot for charts and instruments where all these instruments could be properly cared for and most importantly, calibrated. So he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy in November of 1830. Uh, now this is a Lieutenant writing to the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, he got action in three weeks. Uh, that doesn't happen today. Uh, but it probably helped with the fact that his father was the chairman of the Board of Navy Commissioners, which was the civilian uh, oversight board that basically told the Secretary of the Navy what to do. Uh, and his father-in-law was the Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, just goes to show you that even back in those days, it really paid to have good friends in connected places in Washington. Through his action, the Secretary of the Navy issued an order on December 6th, 1830 to establish the U.S. Navy Depot of Charts and Instruments. Uh, and that was set up in a small building uh, that was located in what was in those days considered to be the low rent district of Washington, 17th and G Streets Northwest. Uh, that's a couple blocks away from the White House. Uh, it was not exactly the neighborhood that it is today. Uh, but Goldsboro set up shop there, and his primary job was to rate chronometers to figure out how fast or how slow they ran. Now, today we have time scales that we produce with atomic frequency standards that are precise to, uh, oh, 
hundred trillionths of a second per day, give or take. Uh, needless to say, in 1830, they didn't have that technology. The best available way or the best available time scale that they had to calibrate chronometers was the time scale that was produced by the mean rotation rate of the Earth. So in order to build a facility where you are going to be essentially calibrating clocks, you have to build an observatory in order to be able to do that. Thus, the Naval Observatory was born. The next officer in charge was Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, this guy right here. Uh, and uh, the initial location of the, this is a map of Washington from uh, uh, back in the, the 1800s. The initial site of the depot was right here. And this is where the White House is right there. Um, well, Lieutenant Wilkes was a fellow of somewhat independent means. Uh, he lived in a very nice house, which we believe is this one here, located just to the north of the United States Capitol. Um, and rather than commute down to that low rent district, he decided he was going to move the observatory to his backyard. Uh, it was a great location, except there was this rather large building that sat on a hill that blocked off some of the southern sky and interfered with transit observations. The only logical solution, of course, if you're an astronomer, is they should tear the building down and level the hill. Uh, but needless to say, that was not an option because these were the people that gave us the money we needed to operate. Uh, Wilkes had a very small instrument that was initially loaned to Goldsboro from the Coast and Geodetic Survey. Uh, and he set this up in uh, essentially in a, in a small building in his backyard and proceeded to start making uh, transit observations, mostly uh, transit observations of the sun. And we even have some of his records left showing the times of transits and his uh, calculations and correction factors that he made. Uh, and you will see that this is transits observed at Observatory Capitol Hill. Uh, and this was in the year 1836. Uh, so he was very busy doing that. But in 1838, uh, he wound up with a rather plum assignment, which was to lead the United States Exploration Expedition uh, that lasted from 1838 to 1842. Uh, so when he departed, Lieutenant James Gillis, who was the last person we saw on that uh, slide a couple of slides ago, uh, became the director or the officer in charge of the depot. Uh, now, Wilkes sailed with a couple of ships. Uh, this is a route of uh, their uh, exploration around the Pacific Rim. He sailed around the world. But you'll also notice down here, he uh, charted a large portion of what uh, was finally recognized as the continent of Antarctica. He was the first person to recognize it as a continent. And there's a sizable portion of Antarctica here south of Australia, which to this day is still known as Wilkes Land. Um, he was not necessarily the best captain. He was somewhat abusive towards his crew. Uh, so he got lots of complaints from the people that served under him. He also made the tactical blunder of uh, as soon as they were clear of uh, U.S. territorial waters, he promoted himself and the lieutenant in charge of the other ship in his expedition to the rank of captain. And when he got back in 1842, he demanded back pay at the captain's rate. Uh, this wound up getting him court-martialed for the first time. Uh, he ultimately was acquitted. Uh, he was court-martialed for a completely different thing in 1861 that almost led to yet another naval war with Great Britain. Uh, he was acquitted in that one, too, and eventually made admiral. So it just goes to show that, uh, you know, you can still get away with stuff. Um, but the fallout of all this was that he came back with a whole bunch of specimens. Uh, he had scientists on board. They had logbooks. They had uh, artists. They had, uh, again, all kinds of specimens. And there was a question of what are they going to do with all this stuff? Well, John Quincy Adams at this point in time was a congressman. He was the first and I believe so far only president who was subsequently elected to the House of Representatives. Adams lobbied for his observatory uh, to be paid for with the money that was left by a British nobleman semi-nobleman named James Smithson. 
eventually, though, uh, of course, Adams's idea fell on deaf ears. Eventually, what they decided to do was take the Smithson bequest and use that to build facilities to house all the stuff that was brought back by Wilkes uh, on this four-year expedition. Thus was born the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, in the background, the whole time is Lieutenant Gillis, who is now uh, dealing with a Navy that's gotten much bigger. There's more chronometers that he has to take care of, and he's still a one-man shop. So he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy in 1842 saying, I can't do my job anymore, but if you give me some funds and build a permanent location and buy decent instruments and give me people to run them and so on and so on, uh, we'll be just fine. And the Secretary wrote back obligingly saying, great idea, no budget. We've all heard that before. Uh, but Gillis was a native Washingtonian and he knew how the game was played. So he eventually came into contact with a senator from South Carolina, W.C. Preston. And in 1842, Senator Preston introduced a bill for the construction of a depot of charts and instruments of the Navy of the United States for the sum of $25,000, which in those days was a big chunk of change. And so the observatory finally had its first permanent home. Unfortunately, the person who was given the opportunity to choose the site was President John Tyler, who was the first president of the United States, who was not elected president of the United States. He was William Henry Harrison's vice president, hated Washington, didn't want to be anywhere near Washington, was much happier in his farm down in Virginia. And when he was in town, he spent a considerable amount of time cruising up and down the Potomac River on a naval gunboat. Uh, so when he was asked to select a site for the observatory, he pointed to a hill that was on the riverbank just east of Georgetown. And he said, let's put it over there. Uh, and that particular area of the city was known then as it is still known today as Foggy Bottom. So let that sink in for just a minute. Anyway, uh, Gillis was just happy to have a place to call home. Uh, he arranged for instruments to be built, uh, got funding to establish the library, uh, did all the groundwork, designed the buildings, oversaw the construction, and he was absolutely certain that he would be named as the first superintendent of this new facility. However, we have a saying here in Washington that no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, in 1844, we got a new Secretary of the Navy who was from Virginia, and he wanted a Virginia Naval officer to be the first superintendent of the observatory. So he appointed Matthew Fontaine Maury as our first superintendent. And just to make sure that Gillis didn't have any say in the matter, they got his detailer to send him to South America for four years. But while he was in South America, he established the first observatory in the Southern Hemisphere in South America, uh, which eventually became the National Observatory of Chile. So Gillis was still involved in building observatories, very, very dedicated individual. So the new observatory was equipped with state-of-the-art instruments made in Europe at the time. We got new transit instruments, uh, and uh, we have here uh, the five-inch, uh, 5.3-inch Mertz and Mahler transit circle telescope, and back here is a four-inch mural circle that was built by Troughton and Sims. Uh, we also had a five-inch Pister and Martin's prime vertical instrument, and the 9.6-inch Mertz and Mahler Great Telescope, as it was then known. Uh, that was our largest telescope. It was our equatorial telescope that was used quite extensively in the early days of the observatory's history. And we hired people to actually uh, use these things. So one of our first astronomers of repute was a gentleman named James Ferguson. Uh, he was a prolific observer with the nine inch telescope. He was actually born in Scotland, came over to the United States. Uh, he was awarded the Lalonde Prize in 1854 and 1860 for his visual asteroid discoveries. And he published over 90 papers during his career more than any other pre-Civil War American astronomer. Uh, he also was somebody that I don't think I'd want to run into on a dark night. He looks rather stern there. 
during this time, uh, as we started moving in towards the Civil War era, we hired a young astronomer by the name of Asaph Hall. Asaph Hall uh, joined the observatory staff in 1862 uh, and began using the 9.6 inch telescope to measure double stars, but he was kind of low man on the totem pole. Uh, so there was a night in the summer of 1863 when he was told that there was an official party coming over from the White House. And uh, that involved the President of the United States and several members of his cabinet. Uh, Hall being kind of the junior guy got stuck with being the tour guide for that. So everybody arrives at the appointed hour, they go up to the dome of the nine inch telescope uh, and Asa Paul shows them the moon and the bright star Arcturus. Uh, subsequently, hour or so later, the official party leaves. Hall goes back to doing his job of measuring double stars. Uh, and the telescope being located at the top of the main building sat on a masonry pier that went all the way down to the basement. And to access the telescope, you had to take a spiral staircase that went up around the pier and go up through a trap door in the floor. Um, well, one of the problems that the astronomers there found was that uh, when all the taverns closed in Georgetown, just to the west of the uh, observatory, uh, people would stagger home. Uh, at two, three o'clock in the morning, usually in an inebriated state. Uh, and the astronomers were constantly putting up with drunks coming in and interrupting them in their work by barging in through the trap door. So they developed this habit of putting a large heavy desk over the door so no one could barge in on. Them. So later on the same night, about two o'clock in the morning, uh, after the, the night, after uh, the night, the morning after the night that Lincoln visited, um, he hears this, uh, Hall hears this persistent knocking on the trap door. And he initially kind of thinks, well, it's probably some drunk from Georgetown. He'll go away and leave me alone. But the knocking became more and more persistent. And finally, Hall decides that he's going to give this fellow a piece of his mind, moves the desk, opens the trap door, up comes a stovepipe hat underneath of which is Abraham Lincoln who had walked by himself at two o'clock in the morning from the White House at 16th and Pennsylvania Avenue over to the observatory at 23rd and E Streets, uh, a fairly sizable stroll in the middle of the night with no bodyguards, uh, because he had a burning question in his mind. In a previous life, Lincoln had been a surveyor and he was used to looking at things through a surveyor's theodolite, which of course gives you a fully erect image. When Lincoln looked at the moon through the nine inch telescope, it was upside down and backwards. And Lincoln could not sleep until he got an explanation as to why that was. So Hall basically said, astronomical telescopes do that. And apparently it satisfied Lincoln because he they spent a little bit more time looking at a few other things. And then he bid Asaph Hall a fond good night uh, and walk back to the White House. Uh, now, over the course of the next couple of the next year or two, uh, he was a frequent visitor to the observatory, uh, and his son Robert Todd Lincoln continued the tradition when Asaph Hall's son worked at the observatory. So we had a very nice connection with the Lincoln family. So if you want to get an idea of what the city looked like and what the observatory situation was, this is the way things looked about 1861. Uh, here's the Capitol building up here. Uh, here's the Potomac River down here. Uh, I live down here in Alexandria. Uh, the observatory was located on this hill right here. And one of the things that you'll notice, and here's the, the beginnings of the Washington Monument down here. So if you've ever been to DC, these should all be fairly familiar landmarks to you. Today, the mall extends way out to here. The Lincoln Memorial would be about in this place. And you'll notice there are creeks and canals that drain into this area that surrounds the observatory. That was basically the septic system for the city in those days. So the city was surround, or the, the observatory was surrounded by two of the biggest open sewers in town. And I don't know if any of you have ever spent any time in Washington in the summer, July and August. It is not a delightful time to be here. I just 
think about those poor astronomers that were working at the observatory on those nice hot July and August nights, and they open the dome to let the wind blow in. Uh, unfortunately, if it's a south wind, it's blowing across this swampy area here, uh, and the aroma must have been uh, rather exquisite, should we say. Um, we find in a number of superintendents reports from that era that they basically say that between May and October, we didn't get a lot done because too many of the staff were sick uh, or dying or somewhere you know, even dead. Uh, we actually had two superintendents who died as a result of malaria contracted while working at the Foggy Bottom site. So what to do? Um, well, let me um, go and getting a little ahead of myself now. Um, in the post-Civil War period, uh, we had uh, a couple of people who came in and really began to do their best to put the observatory uh, on the map as an internationally recognized facility. Uh, both of these gentlemen were essentially founders of the Nautical Almanac Office, which at the time was located up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But Admiral Charles Henry Davis became our superintendent in 1865 and brought the Nautical Almanac office to Washington. His head scientist was Simon Newcomb, this gentleman right here, generally considered to be the most prominent American scientist of the 19th century, even though he was Canadian. But uh, he was instrumental in getting the observatory established as an internationally recognized scientific institution. Uh, between the two tenures, uh, you'll see that Superintendent Davis did actually two tours. Uh, he was uh, relieved for a few years by this gentleman here, Admiral Benjamin Franklin Sands. In 1867, Sands and Newcomb got together and decided that in order for the observatory to really be recognized internationally, we had to go big or go home. Uh, so Admiral Sands persuaded the US Navy to appropriate $50,000 for the construction of what became known as the Great Equatorial Telescope. This was the 26 inch telescope built by Alvin Clark and Sons uh, at the time it was completed in 1873, it was the largest refracting telescope in the world. And here we see Newcomb at the eyepiece and Sands uh, looking on with uh, some amusement, I suppose. Um, the purpose of this was really twofold, not only to have the biggest S uh, refracting telescope in the world, but it was an opportunity to make a statement to show that the United States, both its manufacturing capability and its scientific capability had recovered from the horror of the Civil War. Uh, so 1873, November 12th was first light for the telescope. We still use this telescope today and it will be celebrating the sesquicentennial, I believe that's what it is, of first light next year. Uh, and uh, it should be quite a party. Ace of Hall, once again, comes into play here uh, by the 1870s. He is a commissioned professor in the U.S. Navy Corps of Mathematicians uh, with a very nice commission certificate signed by Abraham Lincoln that we have in our collection. Uh, and over a series of hot August nights, uh, he used the 26-inch telescope to discover Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars. He had found Deimos on the night of August 11th, and then typical Washington summer weather interfered. Uh, he got some brief breaks on the night of the 16th so he could make some measurements of Deimos, uh, enough so that he was able to figure out that it would be visible on the following night. So he went into the dome and began measuring Deimos when he noticed a second object that came out from around Mars, emerged out of the glare, and that turned out to be Phobos. Uh, so down here is a note that says, both the above objects faint, but distinctly seen both by G. Anderson and myself, George Anderson was his night assistant. And so for 24 hours, they were the only two people in the world that knew of the existence of Phobos. Now, of course, we all know it's not real until the boss sees it. 
so the next night, the 18th, they're out in the dome and the next several pages of the logbook are measurements that are made by all the top brass of the observatory. And there is a cryptic note that Hall wrote down here, which said, Newcomb made all the measures on this page. If Simon Newcomb saw it, it had to be real. Uh, so here is an image that I took several, a couple of years ago uh, of uh, Mars, and there is Phobos there. I've uh, had to uh, essentially Photoshop out the glare circle around Mars in order to be able to show it. But this is about as good as Phobos gets. Uh, so it is a very, very tricky thing to see. So by the time of uh, after uh, contemporary to this, uh, we were uh, again uh, at beginning to make our presence felt as the for, at the forefront of international uh, observatories and expeditions. Uh, we mounted a pair of uh, transit of Venus expeditions uh, funded by the Congress uh, for uh, 1874 and 1882. Uh, we had Alvin Clark and Sons build us eight sets of instruments uh, to deploy to various remote locations to make these measurements. Uh, the most interesting of those, I think, is the photoheliostat over here. This is an unsilvered mirror that is driven uh, to track the sun across the sky. It then reflects light down into this tube down here, a focal length of 39 feet. That is a dark room where photographers would sensitize wet plate glass plates, put them in the camera, make the exposures, and then process them before the colloidin dried out. At least that's the way it was in 1874. By 1882, they had dry plates and it was somewhat easier. But again, we dispatched eight sets of uh, observation or observing parties to various remote places around the world in 1874 and 1882. And the whole reason for this was that uh, we had an astronomer, Professor William Harkness, uh, who decided or who realized that if we wanted to get a good idea of the length of the astronomical unit, which of course we're all familiar with today, uh, we needed to find a way to measure that uh, and his proposal was to measure the parallax of Venus as it crossed the disk of the sun from different locations with photographic exposures that were taken simultaneously from those different locations. And as it turns out, uh, despite the fact that Venus has an atmosphere and it was very difficult to time the ingress and egress of the transits, uh, he could still measure the distance of the center of the disk of Venus to the center of the sun and from that determine that parallax. And the value that he came up with for the astronomical unit was within uh, about 2% of the accepted value today. Uh, so this was a pretty momentous uh, set of measurements that he made. By the 1880s, people were getting sick and tired of being down at Foggy Bottom, in addition to being sick and dead in some cases. Uh, so we began working to find a new location for the observatory. Uh, in 1881, we purchased a 75 acre farm in the hills above Georgetown. Uh, and over the course of the next 12 years, we finally got our new location built. Um, one of the reasons that we chose this particular site was that it was out in the country, a uh, very, very rural location in its day, and there was a natural barrier of Rock Creek, which would keep the city well to the east of us, uh, and it would never come and bother us again, or so the theory went. Well, <clears throat> that lasted until about 1910, but anyway, we had a few years where Things were nice and comfy out there. Uh, we moved a number of the transit instruments up from Foggy Bottom, and we also moved uh, the lens of the 26-inch telescope. By the time we moved in 1893 to the new location, <coughs> excuse me, we had found there were a number of shortcomings in the original Alvin Clark mount. So we hired Warner and Swayze to come and build the new mounting for us. Uh, the telescope today is that 1873 Alvin Clark lens mounted on an 1893 Warner and Swayze mounting. 
uh, and we still use it today. This is from an open house that we had several years ago. Uh, and uh, we don't actually look through the telescope anymore. It's now used uh, for a dedicated program to measure double stars with speckle interferometry. Uh, and in the course of the last few years, we have completely automated the telescope. So it now runs entirely under computer control. This is going to pose an interesting problem for us because when we have the sesquicentennial next year, we are hoping to put the eyepiece back on the tail end of the telescope. The problem is, is that we can't manually control the telescope anymore the way we used to. So I have to come up with a computer routine to use the computer to point the telescope to the various things that we're gonna to wanna to look at. Um, well, that'll keep me out of trouble and off the streets for a little while. Uh, but uh, it is, I believe to this day, the oldest continuously operating telescope used by any professional observatory. Uh, and it is also the oldest telescope that has been completely computer driven. Uh, so it's a rather uh, marvelous piece of equipment. Uh, I like to tell people that uh, we got it in 1873 for a little under $50,000, and we're still using it today. Uh, that seems to be a pretty good return on your investment. So uh, we got some new instruments as well. This is a six inch Warner and Swayze transit circle. Um, this instrument was in use for actually, uh, actually in use for over a hundred years. It made its last official observation on the day after the centennial of its first. So we can honestly say that that was the case. Um, but today it is now a display piece in the main lobby of the observatory. We also installed the 12 inch uh, Alvin Clark George Segmuller refractor, which we still use today. Uh, and uh, we also got a 15 inch Warner and Swayze astrograph, which was something of a flop. Um, when it was eventually, uh, it was, it was uh, the, the lens was sent back to Warner and Swayze six times and they couldn't get it to, uh, it was a cooked triplet lens and they couldn't get it to focus over uh, the photographic plate. So we finally just basically bailed on the contract, took the lens back uh, and used it, uh, stopped down to about eight inches. Um, several years ago, the telescope was uh, dismounted <clears throat> and the building was leveled um, and it was basically put on the loading dock and uh, offered to anybody uh, who was willing to come and take it away. Uh, and I don't know if any of you know John Briggs, who is with the Antique Telescope Society. He got wind of it and showed up one day with a crane and a flatbed truck. And he now has the telescope out at his museum in, uh, uh, out in New Mexico. We also saw a number of advances in timekeeping. We used to use pendulum clocks, uh, regulated pendulum clocks uh, for our time scales. But as the 19th century turned to the 20th century, we began using more sophisticated clocks. And the way the original or the way the site was developed uh, in 1893, we had a central clock house where these uh, Riefler pendulum clocks were kept on masonry piers uh, in the basement, uh, and they could be calibrated by observations made with the two transit circles that flanked uh, either side of it. So we could take a mean of observations made with the transit circles and use that as the time scale to calibrate the clocks. And this went on to help with our chronometer rating function. This was something that at the time uh, we were still doing, uh, up until 1950, every chronometer in the U.S. Navy inventory passed through the observatory for rating. So this is one of the chronometer rating rooms here, uh, where we took an electrical signal uh, from the clocks in, in the central building, we call building three, uh, and that would then use, uh, we'd use that electrical signal to drive uh, slave clocks over here, which we could then use as a reference to determine the running rates of all the chronometers that are mounted on the wall and that are in this table here. We also, at this point in time, began distributing time through the wireless or through the uh, Western Union Telegraph Network. So here we have our telegraphic uh, time signal generator, 
Uh, and every day at noon in the Eastern time zone, uh, all the traffic on the Western Union lines would switch over to a dedicated circuit that led to this big box. And precisely at the moment of noon in the Eastern time zone, it sent a synchronizing pulse out. Uh, and that could, use, that could be used to synchronize clocks in every Western Union office in the country. Uh, during the course of this time, we also developed better ways of actually determining time scales. Transit circles are very good, but they have one major flaw, and that is the detector, which is one of these, the human eye. And that's attached to one of these, which is a human brain. And the time it takes for a stimulus to get from here back to here, where it gets processed by the brain, turned into an electrical signal that then goes to here, so you can push a button to mark that instant, not necessarily instantaneous. Each individual observer on the transit circle had to have their so-called personal equation measured about every three months so that we could take that into account when calibrating the observations made with the transit circles. But in the 1930s, we came up with a rather novel idea called a photographic zenith tube. And this basically is an eight inch telescope, uh, eight inch refracting telescope that stares straight up into the sky. Light comes down through here, goes down into a, a well that goes down about 20 feet into the ground where it reflects off a pan of mercury. It then reflects back up here where we have a small photographic plate. And that photographic plate is exposed based on a signal coming from a clock that we have calibrated. Uh, we then can process that photographic plate and measure the uh, position of the star that we're trying to measure the transit of. Uh, and the difference between where that star is on the photographic plate and a ruled line that shows exactly where the meridian is, turns out to be the error of the clock. And we can then recalibrate the clock. A much, much better, more elegant system than uh, the human eye and transit circle. So by the time these devices, the short master-slave synchronomes came into uh, widespread use, uh, we could measure a time scale that was accurate to about a millisecond per day. Uh, and that was the uh, precision that we could get out of these clocks. Um, now, as time went on, uh, they found better ways of keeping time. Uh, a clock is simply two things, it's, or it, it consists of two components. One is an oscillator and the other is a counter. So it follows that if you can get something that oscillates very, very rapidly, you can split the second into smaller and smaller pieces. In the late 1930s and the 1940s, uh, we began using quartz crystal oscillators as our master clock system. Uh, and these could resolve time down to uh, uh, microsecond precision. Um, and then in the 1950s, they began developing the first generation of so-called atomic clocks. Now today, we use these atomic clocks as the basis for our time. Um, but there was a small problem that had to be overcome. Up until 1967, time was defined astronomically. Uh, and we needed to find a way to relate the, the, this astronomical definition of the second to a second that was defined by a specific oscillation of a particular type of atom. So uh, we had an astronomer whose name was William Markowitz and he figured out a way to do this by taking exposures of the moon against background stars. Well, the problem is, is the moon's bright and the stars are faint. Uh, so he needed long exposures to enable him to record the positions of stars, uh, but that would wash out the moon. Uh, but he also needed to know the position of the moon against these stars. So he developed a very ingenious camera that would allow him to take a 20 or 30 second exposure uh, to get the stars. And at the same time, it would have a smaller lens that would follow the moon across the stars as, the, uh, as its motion was carrying it against the starry background. Uh, and then he would take a snapshot in the middle of his long exposure 
uh, and record the position of the moon. So this is called the dual rate moon camera. Uh, ultimately, eight of these were deployed at observatories around the world. And it was through the work that Markowitz did that we now have the definition of the second, which is 9,192,631,770 hyperfine transitions of a neutral cesium-133 atom in, a, uh, in, 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 a, in its ground state. Uh, I will be brutally honest and tell you when I started working at the observatory, I thought the second was one Mississippi. And for the most part, that still works. <laughs> Today, uh, we are in the forefront of timing as far as the world is concerned. Um, we found that the commercial off the shelf uh, atomic frequency standards that we have been using since the 1970s were no longer going to be good enough for the technological demands of the 21st century. Uh, so we went to private industry and said, can you build us something that is 10 times better than the hydrogen masers that we're using? And they basically said, yeah, how many do you want and how much money have you got? Um, so we told them we wanted six of them and they said, oh, that'll bring the cost down to about $10 million a pop. Well, at that particular time, our annual operating budget was $30 million and we do like to pay people. Uh, so we found that it was better to hire four atomic physicists. They designed and our instrument shop built uh, this thing that looks like a big water tank back here. This is actually uh, the magnetic shields that surround our rubidium fountain clock. Uh, this clock takes advantage of a principle in physics that won the Nobel Prize in 1997. And that Nobel Prize winner is this gentleman right here. His name is Bill Phillips, worked at NIST. He shared the Nobel Prize with Dr. Stephen Chu uh, for using, figuring out a way to use lasers to trap and cool atoms to extremely low temperatures. Uh, his, one of his students was this gentleman here, Dr. Steve Peel. Uh, who, along with this gentleman here, Dr. Chris Ekstrom, uh, actually were two of the four physicists that designed and, and our instrument shop subsequently built this device completely in-house. Um, these are amazing devices. If we measure the difference in their ticking rates on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, they are precise to the femtosecond level. That's 10 to the minus 15. So I always tell people, just think about what it's like being late for work at the Naval Observatory. So what about time? It's a good thing you're recording this because you can stop it and take a look at this. Uh, these are the different types of time that we actually have to worry about. Uh, I won't bother to go through all of these, uh, but as you can see, timing is not exactly uh, an easy thing to do. Uh, depending on your need, uh, we have different types of time uh, that can be used for that. Um, now, I have to digress for a little bit here because twice a year, I generally get uh, phone calls, angry emails, and that sort of thing from people who say, why are you telling us to set our clocks forward and backwards? Well, the, 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 the truth of the matter is we have nothing to do with that. We produce a single uniform time standard, which is UTC as realized by the U.S. Naval Observatory. We don't tell people what to do with it. Uh, that is because that function, which is legislated by standard time acts to pass by Congress, that is, uh, excuse me, that has to be enforced by a civilian agency. Uh, and the people, the lucky people that get to do that are the folks at the Department of Transportation because standard time came about because railroads decided they didn't wanna have trains crashing into each other. Uh, and the old Interstate Commerce Commission regulated the trains uh, and that is now Department of Transportation. And so that's how standard time and uh, daylight time fell into their bailiwick. So the next time you have to set your clocks back or forward and you get steamed about it, uh, call the Office of General Counsel at the Department of Transportation. Please don't call me. So today the U.S. Naval Observatory has a fairly sizable footprint. 
Our headquarters is located in Washington, but we have a dark sky site, which is located uh, just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, we also have another facility out there, the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer. This is a joint program that we do with uh, Naval Research Lab and Lowell Observatory, and it's sited at Lowell Observatory's Anderson Mesa Station. Uh, if someone were to trip over the giant power cord for our master clock system, fear not. Uh, the alternate master clock facility that we operate is co-located with the Master Control Center for Global Positioning System uh, at Shriver Space Force Base in Colorado. Uh, we also own and uh, collaborate with a number of other radio observatories around the world. Uh, our antenna happens to be located in Koki Park in, on the island of Kauai. Uh, I keep telling the superintendent that he's got to send the PAO out there to do some documentation of the place. He hasn't done that yet, but hopefully I'll get a chance to go there. Um, and this is used for determining what we call Earth orientation parameters because the Earth is not a very good timekeeper. It wobbles all over the place. Uh, and we need to take that into account when we are dealing with time scales that are defined by atomic frequency standards. So today, this is what our headquarters looks like here in Washington. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, it's still kind of a park-like setting. Uh, we have a 75-acre uh, campus. <clears throat> and yes, indeed, the vice president does live uh, kind of down over in this part, down over in here. Um, I've had interactions with all the vice presidents since Al Gore, uh, and they are very interested. Some, some of them are interested, some are more interested than others, uh, but they always come up and have uh, a great time whenever we give them a chance to show the place off. Uh, this is our Flagstaff station out uh, just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. That was established in 1955. Our largest telescopes are located in Flagstaff. So we have a 61 inch astrometric reflector out there. Uh, we also have a 40 inch Ritchie Chrétien telescope. This was the last telescope that was actually built by George Willis Ritchie himself, uh, completed in 1934. Uh, we moved it out to Flagstaff in 1955 because the light pollution of Washington essentially rendered it useless there. Um, the 61 inch telescope was the telescope that was used by this gentleman uh, to actually discover Charon, the largest moon of Pluto. Uh, and what happened was he was tasked, uh, this is Jim Christie, he was tasked with analyzing photographic images of Pluto so that we could improve our ephemeris for the almanac. And he noticed that some of the images of Pluto had a lump on one side and some of them didn't. And he soon found that the lump would go from here to here in a little over three days. And he began to see that there was a regular uh, six plus day uh, uh, period uh, that this thing would go back and forth on. Uh, that information eventually was passed on to this gentleman, Bob Harrington, who analyzed the images. Uh, and he was able to work out the orbit of what is now Charon uh, around Pluto. Um, and this was all done in 1978. Uh, in a way, uh, it's kind of sad that this happened because basically uh, it was this discovery that killed Pluto and made it a dwarf planet. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we also still operate a transit circle out there. This is an eight inch automated transit circle, and this is used very extensively by NASA to uh, determine, uh, to measure the positions of moons of the outer planets, uh, main belt asteroids, uh, and other things that need a uh, very, very rapid response when they're discovered. Uh, so uh, we still do transit observations, uh, but again, this one is completely automated uh, and uh, doing a lot of, uh, probably the, the bulk of the work uh, that we observe out in Flagstaff and it's only an eight inch telescope. All of these things are now anchored to fundamental reference frame, uh, what we call the International Celestial Reference Frame, 
We use our VLBI station in Cokie Park along with VLBI stations around the world to make daily measurements of the positions of quasars. And from those measurements, we can determine what are called Earth orientation parameters. And these essentially track the irregularities in the Earth's rotation and the wanderings of the Earth's rotational poles. Uh, without very precise measurements of these things, uh, the information that you get from your GPS uh, will go bad in about a month. Uh, so it's extremely important that we understand exactly how the Earth is oriented in space. And we have found that looking at 4,500 quasars gives us a very good reference frame against which we can measure that. So we also have the optical interferometer that's located out at Anderson Mesa. This is a rather innovative instrument. It is the first instrument that has been able to optically observe very, very high resolution uh, or take high resolution measurements in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, so for an example, here is an image uh, which was actually taken probably 20 years ago now uh, of the uh, triple star system Eta Virginis. Most of us know it as a double star, uh, but as it turns out, the A component is a very close binary uh, and the separation between these two stars is five milli arc seconds, uh, which in my book is pretty darn close. We also are in the business of creating large scale uh, star catalogs. This was the instrument that we used to create our most recent large ground based catalog, the Naval Observatory's robotic astrometric telescope, known as URAT. Uh, it has a camera on it, which is called the Four Shooter. Uh, it weighs about 200 pounds. It's cooled by liquid nitrogen. <clears throat> and we call it the Four Shooter because it has four of these. Uh, front illuminated CMOS uh, uh, sensors on it. Uh, each one of these is 112 megapixels. Uh, by combining four of them uh, at the focus of a uh, eight inch uh, lens, uh, each image can cover about 28 square degrees of the sky. Uh, and we have mapped the entire sky down to 19th magnitude from Flagstaff and from uh, Cerro Tololo with this instrument. Uh, so the URAT catalog is currently the best available ground-based star catalog. Uh, it is complete to about 19th magnitude. That encompasses about half a billion stars. And to give you an idea of how this improves our ability to map stars, uh, this is the Tico 2 catalog. Uh, this is uh, M11, uh, and this is how it was mapped by the Hipparchos satellite, the European satellite back in uh, the late 80s. Uh, it was uh, the first generation of our uh, astrographic catalog was the, uh, uh, the UCAC uh, from around 2010. <clears throat> that utilized a single 2400 by 2400 CCD, um, but you can see a lot more stars than that. And this is the same field of view now uh, with the URAT. So if you want stars, we got stars. So to kind of sum things up, uh, the Naval Observatory is responsible for doing two things. Uh, and it would be a very short talk if I started this way. Our job can be summed up in two words, and that is reference frames. Uh, we are the people who are responsible for determining the, the master celestial reference frame on which everything else is essentially hung. <clears throat> and we are also responsible for uh, the temporal reference frame for anything that has to do with precise timing in the Department of Defense. And our biggest customer for that is Global Positioning System. So if you have a GPS receiver, uh, if you have a smartphone, which is getting its time from GPS, you are essentially getting Naval Observatory time. Uh, so uh, we do kind of, in many ways, touch the lives of uh, a significant portion of the population of the planet. <clears throat> so we have a motto because we have been around for a long time. And this was a motto that was uh, uh, essentially uh, the seal and the motto were taken, or the seal was designed by 
uh, Admiral Charles Henry Davis back in 1867, and he chose as a motto uh, a, uh, a, a, a saying from uh, the Roman astronomer Manilius, uh, which roughly translates, then to the pilot's care, the stars are scaled and sky with ocean joined. And for those of you who want to dive a little bit deeper, uh, here are a couple of web addresses for you. Uh, the top one will take you to the Naval Observatory webpage. There is tons of information there. And my personal webpage that has some, some of my astro photos and everything on it uh, is the one that's down at the bottom. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I've probably taken too much of it, but I'm happy to entertain a few questions. Uh, and uh, unless you are hard pressed to conduct business, but the floor is open. I have one already. Yes. First of all, Jeff, that's fantastic. I, I didn't know 90% of this about USNL. I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed. Um, how are public tours, if they're available at the USNO, handled with the vice president living on the premises? Well, uh, the vice president is not really uh, a factor as far as that goes. Um, unfortunately, we don't do public tours anymore. I had to stop doing those in 2017 because we do have the master clock system for the Department of Defense. And um, for some reason, uh, nobody really thought of this before, but in 2017, uh, we had some folks from Big Navy that came in and they said, you know, this is a strategic resource and we probably shouldn't let people come in here and, you know, kind of wander around without knowing who they are. Um, and, uh, they essentially said that I could no longer conduct public tours. Uh, so most of the tours that we do today will be for special interest groups. Uh, I can take small groups around, uh, but most of the people that come to visit us these days are folks from the government and the Department of Defense. I actually had two tours today, uh, for some folks that are involved in, uh, outfitting our new master clock facility, which is uh, going to go online uh, in another couple of years. Uh, it is the uh, first building that has been built from the ground up, dedicated to the happiness of atomic frequency standards. Um, the other visitor that I had today was the commander of uh, the Fifth Fleet, and the commander of uh, Department of, of, of the uh, Department of Defense Central Command, uh, a vice admiral. So you never quite know who's going to walk through the door. And, and where was the old <coughs> observatory site? Is that now where the Ellipse or White House is? Or? No, that's uh, the old observatory site is still there. Uh, it is located at 23rd and uh, E Street in Washington. Um, and again, uh, it's in the area that's called Foggy Bottom. It is across the street from the headquarters of the State Department. And the State Department actually now owns the building. I see. Uh, there is still a small Navy presence there. There is uh, two flag quarters down there, one of which is for uh, the Admiral who is in charge of nuclear propulsion. And the other one is the residence of the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. Um, but the building itself, the old observatory building, uh, is still there. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. And I actually have to go and, and uh, talk to somebody down at the State Department because the building has been neglected, should we say, uh, since uh, the Navy uh, turned it over to State Department about five years ago. All right, I see there's a chat up here. Let's see, what's that? Oh, okay, thank you, Amy B. So anyone else have any questions? Well, if not, I have one other. The, the reference frame using quasars, I assume that's because they're stellar, stellar objects uh, with no appreciable proper motion whatsoever. Right, now yeah. we used to use transit circles to establish a fundamental star catalog. Uh, and the transit circles are limited to looking primarily at bright stars. The problem is, is that bright stars are generally nearby stars and they move. So 
every 50 years, you would have to reobserve your fundamental catalog so that you would have updated positions due to the proper motions of all your reference stars. And then you would have to completely remeasure all of your star positions from your photographic plates and whatnot with your stellar measuring engines. And you would have to precess everything. So it involved an enormous amount of work to produce a star catalog. Um, now, uh, quasars are so far away that the only component of motion that they show on the plane of the sky is radially away from us. There is no XY motion. And they turn out to be, uh, they're, they're essentially point sources. They're very bright in the radio. And they have the added advantage that they are also highly visible in the visible and the infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, so we can actually take the quasar reference frame and we can find the optical counterparts in our deep fields that we expose for our star catalogs. And we've got our reference benchmarks right there. Uh, and it makes uh, reducing the star positions much easier. It also makes the measurement of proper motions of all those stars much easier. Uh, so our URAT catalog has uh, not only the positions of about half a billion stars down to 19th magnitude, uh, but it also has proper motions for about 25% mm -hmm. of those stars. And it was oh. John Quincy Adam. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. No, 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 I've hogged the floor. You, you take it. So we, ha we have uh, one question from the dark of the Juan Seidler Observatory here. In All right. Okay, um, you, with what you were just talking about with the star catalogs, I remember uh, back in the 80s when it changed from, uh, from Epic 1950 to Epic right. 2000. Are you saying that now that it's going to be pretty well accurate from, it no longer has to have those epics and it's going to be accurate now? No, uh, you still have to redo, you, you have to reduce all of your star positions and take into account precession. Uh, so the precessional epochs are generally updated. The IAU generally updates those every 50 years. Okay. So we're getting to that point now where we're gonna have to think, do we wanna keep using the 2000 reference frame or are we gonna start thinking about using the 2050 reference frame? Uh, in terms of the processional epoch. Um, the relative positions of the stars to each other, uh, we can measure that uh, with, we, we can use their proper motions to determine those um, against the reference frame of quasars, but we still have to, uh, we still have to uh, factor in the precession uh, that takes place in that 50 year interval. I forgot about that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Remember, I mean, in, in procession, uh, the equinox moves about the equivalent of the apparent diameter of Jupiter in a year. So it doesn't sound like much, but uh, you let it go 50 years, and now you're talking almost a degree. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. I get it. <laughs> I know that uh, John Quincy Adams dedicated the University of Cincinnati Observatory. Right. I think 1843. Right. Uh, was he involved in your dedication? I think he was just no. one year out of office. No, he uh, he was uh, out of office when the depot was founded, and the, and the depot was basically uh, kind of pulled out of a hat by Lewis Goldsboro. Mm -hmm. um, they gave him a budget of $330 for fiscal year 1831. So <clears throat> it was not a high priority item. Uh, Adams was very interested though, uh, always had been interested in uh, establishing a national observatory. Uh, and so even as a Congressman, he was the one, I mean, he was, he, he lobbied very, very long and hard to get the Smithson bequest to fund an observatory. And had that happened, it would have been a windfall for us because the, the Smithson bequest at the time, uh, 1842, was half a million dollars, which, you know, that's kind of like Elon Musk today. OK, 
Okay. Anyone else? Well, I, don't Jeff. Have, I don't have a question, but I wanted to let you know that this was this was really awesome. There was so much information that I never even dreamed, dreamed of all the stuff that took place for this. Well, as I say, it keeps us out of trouble and off the streets at night. <laughs> Yeah, except I'm gonna leak, I'm gonna leak your name to a lot of people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With your Jeff, permission. Um, so we recorded tonight. Is it okay to post this uh, video? Oh, on absolutely. Our YouTube? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So, on behalf of the members of the Evansville Astronomical Society and anyone else that's been online with us this evening, I want to thank you for a, a, a great talk. It's it's been a a wonderful, a wonderful time spending an hour or so with you. And uh, I'll just turn it over to Chuck to close us out. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. All righty.